Hi, good afternoon, and welcome to the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft. I'm Natalie Swachina, the Associate Deputy Director, and we're very excited to have you here this afternoon to learn more about two of our current resident artists. If you don't know, our residency program houses artists all across the United States and across the world for anywhere from three, six, nine months to a year. The residents have open studio space, meaning the public can visit their studios two days a week. And in return, the residents get to meet the Houston community, collaborate with each other and connect to craft in general. This is our second talk in our current series of our current cycle of resident artists. So we're super happy to hear from Lakia Shepard and Rebecca Sweeta today. We're up first, up first is Lakia Shepard. Lakia, if you wanna jump on. And I should say too, if anyone has any comments, please drop them in the, we'll have a Q&A after each artist and I'll moderate. So please send any questions or comments for Lakia in the chat. So to start, thank you Lakia for being here. Lakia is in the middle of her nine month residency and she'll be here until the end of May. Plenty of time to come visit her studio. She's also leading a beaded earring workshop next month, I think, correct? So lots of ways to interact with Lakia. Um, based in her, well, not formally based in her hometown of Salem, North Carolina, Lakia is a me mixed media artist, designer, sculptor, and milliner. Raised by her mechanic, uh, raised by a mechanic and a textile worker, birthed the artist's passion for designing head sculptures using traditional African textile techniques, including beading, weaving, and basketry. Lakia studied visual arts at the UNC School of Art and received her BFA in crafts with a focus in fibers at the, at the Creative College for Creative Studies in 2013. She also attended the New York Studio Residency Program in Dumbo, New York City. Her work has been shown in many galleries, including the Contemporary Art Museum in Riley, North Carolina. And you also have a lot of fun and exciting um, exhibitions and shows you've been in this year that I know Lakia will mention as well. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Natalie. Um, thank you guys for joining me. I will be sharing my screen so you guys can follow along. Again, my name is Lakia Shepard. Can you guys hear me well? My name is Lakia Shepard and I started my residency here in Texas in September. As you see, I was super excited to um, get the Fishbowl uh, studio. So um, <clears throat> as soon as I moved in, I dove right in. I knew exactly um, which route I wanted to take with my work. Uh, before coming to Texas, this is the last piece that I created. This is a three and a half foot tall wall hanging that is also a mask. Uh, normally my work is, normally my work is wearable, but I wanted to try something different. But now that I have accomplished that, I want to, I wanted to go back into creating wearable pieces. So with that, a lot of my work is, a lot of my work is based around material development, such as beading, basketry, um, weaving, embroidery, embellishment. So I wanted to be able to take a lot of the materials that I found within Houston and let that kind of guide my, my work. So with that, I decided to try some new, uh, new textile methods. So I decided to create some cord. Instead of purchasing cord, I decided to try to make my own, um, which I was successful at here, as you see. This is another one here. Just trying to figure out what type of textiles and what type of materials work best for the basketry that I was going to create. And this is another example. So these are all samples that I decided to make. And with the samples, 
I wanted to create little small um, completed pieces of work as well. So as you see here, this is just a, a small completed piece with the samples that I created. And then that brought me into using strands of beads, which is really, really big in, in my work, um, individual beads. But this, this time I decided to take the idea of using cords and strands and kind of trying to figure out how I can utilize that within the basketry. <clears throat> and this is just a, you know, trial and error, just trying to, to find my way through the new materials that I was uh, coming across. So a really cool thing about Houston that I found was the gym shows. I'm really, really into gyms. So as soon as I found out that there was, were gym shows, I definitely had to go. And I find a lot of inspiration through gems and minerals, just the textures and the colors uh, that, they, that they have. So as I'm going through the gym show, I'm kind of letting it, you know, dictate my, my color story. Um, and I was able to purchase 13 pounds of stones, as you see here in this photograph on the right. The biggest lot that I've bought thus far. I couldn't help myself. So now that I had an idea of the material choices, um, I decided to dive right into the mass that I wanted to create. So my work, my current work really, uh, it involves artifacts while also colliding with uh, contemporary crafts. So I wanted to focus on really old silhouettes, um, um, crafts and different methods that has been lost or stolen over time, such as African masks. So this is the piece that I decided to focus on <clears throat> and I dove right in. This is a sketch of the direction of my cord that I was going to use within my basketry. So within my work, I utilize one single cord and I have to figure out a way to create a three-dimensional object with a single cord. So this is a very vital aspect within my work, trying to figure out the direction of that cord so I don't have to cut it or alter it in any way. So now we're getting into the good stuff. So here I decided to create the overall silhouette first and build from the chin up as you see here on the right. I had to have fun while making it. As you see, I am gradually going up towards the eyes and I'm still constantly checking my photograph or my sketch just to make sure that I'm on target. In the process, again, I like to have fun, but I also want to make sure that my work is wearable so I have to be my own model and make sure that it fits. Checking the side. And finally, I've come to the end of creating the structural structural portion with um, the basket tree. And I'll share this with you guys, just as a sped up version of me closing in this headpiece. So with basket tree, I am constantly wrapping the cord and connected, connecting it to the previous cord. So that is what I'm showing you guys right now. Which becoming this.
So once that was completed, I actually had to put it aside because I was asked to join a functional light show at Kish Kishka Gallery in Vermont. So I had to put the mask on hold to shop for more supplies and more materials. So again, I wanted to make use of all of the aspects of art and materials within Houston. So I went to Art Asylum to check out their yarn selection, which was phenomenal. And this is what I came up with. I decided to stick with neutrals. As you see on the right, I have a bunch of shades of creams and tans and whites and different textures and different types of fibers. Partnering it with my sketch. This is a very loose sketch. I knew I wanted this piece to have fluidity and I wanted it to kind of feel very intuitive. So I only did a silhouette sketch for this and got to work. I used a ton of yarn for this piece. As you see, it is very tightly woven. And you can kind of see it gradually growing in the photo on the right. Within the process, I'm constantly making sure that I'm on track with my sketch, making sure that I am looking at the lamp from all angles to make sure that no matter what side you're looking at, it's intriguing and, and different. And here the final piece, um, it came out very well. As you see at the bottom where the light is, it starts very pure white and it gradually turns darker and darker once it gets to the top. I know, there's a photo of me with the eye patch. During this process, I uh, poked myself in the eye with a needle but I could not let that stop me from creating this piece because I was definitely on a uh, timeline, a time limit. It took me about five to six weeks to make this lamp. Now that that's done, I was able to get back to the mask. So with the mask, Instead of creating hair on top of the mask, I decided to use vessels. Um, and I got this idea from a documentary about the slave trade. So with this process, I am still using basketry, but then I am also trying to stretch my imagination and challenge myself by creating a different vessel each time that I make one. Um, I am currently on number 26 and I started in mid-December. With my work, I always incorporate red thread. You may or may not see it within my work, but it will be there. And this is just a video showing me incorporating it into this vessel you see on the right. Two other options. And while I was in the process of creating this, these vessels, um, I did have a solo show at the Ace Hotel in Brooklyn. So I was able to fly out to New York. And within that time span, they had a show called Hear Me Now at the Met. Um, the Black Potters of Old Eaglefield, South Carolina. Phenomenal show. And I'm so glad I was able to catch it because history and learning about Black culture is really, really important within my work. So I was able to learn a little bit more about vessels and pottery and um, 
Black craftsmen. Phenomenal show. And with this show, they also included contemporary artists as well. And after that, I was able to fly back into North Carolina where I'm from um, because I was asked to be a part of another show with Wake Forest University in collaboration with Guilty by Association. And we did a documentary on how um, I utilize beads and the materials that I utilize within my work and the processes behind them. So I had a wonderful, wonderful crew of videography crew to follow me around Winston-Salem and document my process, my craft process. This was very new to me. This was, um, stepping out of my comfort zone, but it challenged me to be able to talk about my work a little bit more and then to also share the, the hidden gems within Winston-Salem um, as far as bead stores, art supplies. I would love to share this documentary with you guys if you all are interested. Doing this gave me a lot of inspiration to come back to Houston and to uh, be able to utilize even more materials that I didn't have access to in Winston-Salem. And after that, like I said, I did have a solo exhibition at the Ace Hotel in Brooklyn. And this is how it came out. Some close-up shots of the pieces. These two pieces sold. The one on the right now is in the permanent collection at Wake Forest University. And I ended up in the New York Times for my show. It was amazing turnout. Um, this is something that I never expected to happen. And I'm grateful that it happened during my residency because my residency gave me the time and the opportunity to actually fly out and be able to be present for such a, an, an amazing event. The editor in chief of Vogue China was there. Really amazing turnout for this show. David Byrne, of course, was there. So many wonderful people. Once I flew back into Houston, one of the best parts about my residency was just being able to talk to the students and the kids who were interested and inspired by art and just being able to talk to a bunch of growing artists to inspire them was a really pivotal moment for me here at the craft center. Hands on Houston was a lot of fun. I was able to actually share 
my love for beads with a lot of people. A lot of people came out to make beaded bracelets with me. Definitely a highlight for my, my residency thus far. We had a ton of beads available. Everyone having fun. And the turnouts were great. Look at these two bracelets. They are really unique. And that's what I loved about this, this workshop here, Hands on Houston. Everybody's beaded bracelet was one of a kind. And then also with my work, it's very important for me to be in the field of art, get involved with the community, support other artists such as Benny, Anthony, going into Chinatown, checking out art, ceramics, illustrators, drawers, just gaining inspiration from all over. The Manil, the Twombly gallery was phenomenal, very inspirational to my work. Rocco Chapel. And then also checking out uh, excuse me, Nick's Cave, Nick Cave's show at the Guggenheim. Um, <clears throat> Nick Cave has been an inspiration to my work for many, many, many years. So I was able to actually catch a very, very phenomenal show of his at the Guggenheim. It's very important for me to get into the field of galleries and museums because it's important for me to know as an artist and a, and a craftswoman, it's important for me to know um, the history behind the things that I'm doing and things that I'm creating and being a part of such a community has been very impactful here in Houston and I am very much so grateful for this residency and to continue the next five months and make some beautiful art. So thank you guys. Thank you so much, Lakia. I loved seeing some of your um, photos that you've been working on this week, but I really love seeing some of your inspiration photos, you know, places you've been, you've had a very exciting time while you've been a resident here. Um, and I love seeing David Byrne at your, at your opening, which was really, really fun. Um, leave, please leave any questions in the chat for Lakia. We do have one and I have a couple of my own, so I'm going to start out, but please leave any others you have. Um, our first one is from Amy. Um, hi, Amy. Um, what is hi, the significance of the red thread? Um, she loves your work as well. The significance of the red thread. Um, mm -hmm. This is something that I started in college and um, <clears throat> I was trying to create an identity for my work and I was doing a lot of research um, on African art, just African culture. And a lot of women in certain parts of Africa, they would wear red in their hair or on their skin or red around their belly to signify uh, womanhood, fertility and um, growth. So I found that very inspirational. So I decided to incorporate that within my work while also simultaneously 
um, symbolizing bringing life within within my work because most of my work, if not all of it, is very conceptual and it is very um, personal and um, I consider all of my ideas and all of my thoughts to be a living entity. So it is symbolic of things running through uh, a living form or a living body. When you say living body, that brings up a question I was thinking about in your work of just this aspect of experimentation and almost play with it. I was thinking about that with the um, sculpture you were starting with the earrings that you found materials and, you know, and going to art asylum and gathering these found materials or reused materials and, and literally, you know, experimenting and playing with form. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about that type of experimentation where you don't really know how you're you're going to use a material, yet you seem to have this, um, it evolves and has a life of its own. Yeah, so I kind of consider myself a, uh, a material hoarder. Uh, <laughs> so I kind of <laughs> just accumulate materials from all over. I'm, I'm an avid thrifter, so I like to, to buy necklaces and all types of jewelry, even clothing with beading on it and if I really like the beading um, I would just kind of repurpose it I would cut it off sort it out and um, store it away until the right idea comes about so there are materials that I've had for 10 years and I finally found an idea to to utilize those and because my work is so dense with um, concept I do like to have that playful aspect of it within the materials that I use. You know, one thing I, I thought of too, um, and we've talked about this some with your work too, is the use of videos that you've used to share. You know, you use so many videos in the presentation and I know sharing your work um, or sharing your process is a big part of your practice. And what we really didn't talk about as much either during the talk was, you know, your use of photography. And I think from the Ace Hotel photos, you could see how you photographed some of your beaded mask on, on, on people and display those as well. So maybe you could talk about your use of video and photography within your practice. So art to me is very, is a very sacred thing. And for a long time, I did not like to share uh, the behind the scenes process of my work. And um, one day I just realized like I put so much effort and so much time in my work and it may not, sometimes people can't conceptualize the time frame that it takes. So I just decided to share the stories behind it and, you know, just pouring a lot of like, emotion into my work and capturing that has brought a new element to the pieces and just also taking photographs and thing or giving the viewers an opportunity to see the pieces live is really important to me. Which leads us to your documentary. Is the documentary coming out? How can we watch it? Yes, so it is already out. It's on Guilty by Association's website um, is gbafamily.com um, so it's on their site but um, I think it's about 10 minutes long it is a, a collaborative uh, documentary it's five artists and me being one of them so you guys should definitely check it out it's great it's really good. Yeah, why don't you send it to me during our next talk and I'll post it okay. in the chat so everyone okay can. absolutely and my last question for you is, and you have a bunch of fans in the chat, so you're going to have to go back and read it. Okay. Um, Benny, whose work you mentioned, a fellow um, alumni resident, Benny Flores Ansel, and her installation. So we always love to see our, our community here as well. But so you, you're planning on staying in Houston, right? Or what's your yes. plan for the next, um, you're here for the, till the end of May, but what's your plans after that? Yes. So I, once I got the notification that I was accepted for the residency, um, at that moment, I decided to permanently move to Houston. So Houston is my new home. Um, I am looking forward to exploring all the museums that I haven't touched base with yet. Um, so this is this has been like a really big step for me, um, me as well as like for my for my work. So um, this is definitely a growing phase for me. 
Well, we're so happy that Houston will be your new home and you'll continue to be part of our craft center community. Yeah, I'm excited. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your, your studio and your practice with us. It's been wonderful to chat this afternoon. And as you guys can see, I have all of the vessels hanging up here on the wall. But yeah, thank you guys. If you're Houston based, you still have time till the end of May to come visit Lakia in her studio and see her vessels and mask and beads in person. Absolutely. And I do want to mention, and I'll put it in the chat as well, that Lakia is leading a beaded earring workshop for us, an adult workshop on April 22nd. And there are some spots still available. So if you want to learn direct from Lakia herself, some beading techniques, please sign up for that. And I'll drop that in the chat. Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lakia. Thank you, guys. I'm going to move on to our next resident, Rebecca. I'll give Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. Hello. Hi, Natalie. Yeah. So Rebecca Suida, um, you're here as a clay resident until the end of this month. So only a few more days to come check out Rebecca and her studio, everyone. So please make sure to stop by and, and visit her. Rebecca focuses on interventions to the traditional wheel, wheel thrown ceramic work. She works in various clay bodies using cuts and slices to activate empty space as material itself. Rebecca received a dual degree in chemistry and studio art from Calvin University in 2018 and an, and an MFA in, from Cranbrook Academy of Art in 2020. Later that year, she exhibited the solo show Amphora featuring works exploring the sense of loss she felt during the pandemic. And in 2021, she exhibited the, der the Derived Vessel, a solo show that finalized the ideas around her graduate work. Prior to joining the Craft Center as a resident, she completed a residency in Rome. She's also the creator and founder of Suida Studio, a ceramic studio, a ceramic school and studio in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which will open in March of 2023. So very soon, next month. <laughs> so we've had Rebecca here at the Craft Center for nearly three months now, and it's been wonderful to have you and your work here. And I'm going to turn it over to you. Please leave any comments and questions you have for Rebecca in the chat, and we'll come back for a Q&A at the end. Perfect. Thank you so much, Natalie. I really appreciate that introduction. Um, as well as Lakia, fantastic presentation. I always love seeing your work and I am getting really excited that you're doing lots of vessels. It makes me very excited as well. So thank you again for joining us here. Really appreciate the Craft Center for having these talks. I think it's a really wonderful way of reaching out to communities. So like said, my name is Rooka Suida. Um, I am from Colorado, born and raised in Colorado, and then moved to Michigan um, to go get a degree in chemical engineering and then realized I don't want to be a chemical engineer, actually. But I stayed with chemistry and uh, found uh, ceramics uh, partway through my education in Michigan um, and realized the wonderful potential of chemistry and creativity that I was hoping to find in engineering and did not find there. And I found it in ceramics. And so it became this really wonderful um, like art form that I just absolutely fell in love with. And I wanted to show some really fun photos of me. This is me in graduate school, but they're just me. I just fell in love and just had so much fun with it. Um, I wanted to share some, I'm, I'm gonna go in chronological order for my work and just sort of flow through the ideas that um, I had early on and to now and how they've all flowed together. This is one of the earliest pieces that I had that I was very proud of for myself as um, uh, I, I just started ceramics that year in 2015. Uh, this is a porcelain piece, only about five inches tall. Uh, it looks bigger on the screen than it actually is. And I, this is where I fell in love with the idea of ceramic in negative space and working with the material as it is. Um, so what I did is I made, made this piece and then I poured glaze on top of it and it naturally created these Dr. Seuss-esque mountain ranges on it that made me really fall in love with this just abstract landscape that was created. I went on and stayed in doing ceramics the entire time that I was there um, in, at Calvin University. And I ended up making this, uh, what I call a batik tea set inspired by um, Indonesia, uh, the Indonesian batik set um, that they had there, as well as uh, Dutch uh, tea ceremonies. It was a very interesting connection because the Dutch colonized Indonesia 
And the school that I went to, um, Calvin University, is a predominantly Dutch community around there. So it was a, a very interesting. I, I went to Indonesia in 2016, was so inspired by its uh, their visual communication and using pattern as a way as, of communicating what island you are in Indonesia, as well as what sort of royalty or hierarchy level that you are. Um, and I, I, that's what made me really fall in love with uh, visuals as a way of communicating. So I wanted to do this as sort of like what I learned from everything going to Indonesia and processing all that. So from here, so that I, this was my final graduation piece that I made. Um, and then I, I immediately went to grad school. So I have this slide in here as sort of an idea of the thoughts that I had going into grad school and leaving grad school. Um, Clifford on the left is a Clifford Still painting. Clifford Still has always been a very big inspiration to me. Abstract painters in general, I really love it, but I love his use of uh, canvas as a material and paint as a material rather than just as decoration. Um, and I've just loved his deconstruction of paintings in general. And then on the right is a photo from an Instagram. Uh, their Instagram handle is Constant Bagel Therapy. They have a lot of really fun illustrations. But I really loved this one as a very interesting way of deconstructing things that we think are very normal. <laughs> they have just like their football pitch, very interesting, and then deconstructed all of the lines, including the text. And I, I love the, that deconstruction as a way of making something interesting. So going into grad school, this is where I first started out. I tried making um, uh, tiles. So these are large tiles about seven inches across and, and as a in full installation this is about eight feet by four feet um this was my first big installation piece that i was trying at and i think it was largely successful i wanted to make it go from very nice tile to pushed tile and it, you can see it's really working with that negative space as a way of making shape as well as um uh, the my hand, you can really see my hand marks and my, my fingerprints in the entire thing. So you can really see the maker's hand in it. Um, so it was a great experimentation. So then I went on to these experiments. These are the first iterations of what I've been working on since then of trying to figure out a new way of making shapes from uh, throned vessels. So for me, I, uh, I I had to take a lot of chemistry classes in uh, undergrad because of my chemistry degree, or not chemistry classes, excuse me, calculus classes because of that. And so they, I was really inspired by this one uh, form or this one uh, uh, formula that is used to find the area under a curve. Um, and to do it, you take it, the sum of like an infinite number of slices of that curve and you add together all those slices and that's how you get your area. And I, what I liked that as like a, a metaphor as a slice as sort of a snapshot or a, a new look into something that you might be, fam or like might be familiar with. So these are really small, really only three inches tall um, for the largest one. And they were my first little small experiments. I went on to make larger forms and throw larger forms. And you can see that I tried to use those forms in many different ways. Um, I cut, every which direction just to see what kinds of shapes that I was getting from every type of form that I was throwing. I tried using those shapes as a way of printmaking and finding different ways of using that negative space. And I had a lot of fun with it. <laughs> but in this realm, I, I really kept with it being very mathematical, very shape and form oriented, not very emotional at all. Just about discovery of uh, ceramic and that was it. This piece is a set of 12 cups that I created um, and I wanted to explore that slice in a new way. So instead of slicing it myself, I, I took the glaze. When you have glaze, it's in a solution of water and it creates the, that water creates a, a, a plane, right? So I wanted to try to figure out and use that water plane as a new way of form creating and using a slice in a new way, but it's still very functional. From there, this is my going on to my second year in, in grad school, and I started making larger forms. And with those larger forms, you can really see the scale with it. This is a really fun photo a friend of mine took of me. Um, and the one on the left is just a little bit shorter than it. Um, what I started doing with these is I started um, making pieces that only had one cut. 
um, the left is sort of the first one that I started doing with it. And I really appreciated and loved how with that one cut, what happened was the piece went from being like a piece in the round to a piece sort of that had a front that wanted to confront the viewer. And I, I loved that as a way of um, just like the, just the visual confrontation in that sense. I wanted to figure out a new way of using that negative space as well. So I started making some forms where I would take the negative space and then throw another form that would perfectly fit into that negative space. So this piece on the, both the piece on the left and the right, but more so on the left, the, it's, I made a lid. And so the only way you can take that lid out is by taking it through that negative space. And the same for this one, but it's on the bottom where you take it and you pull it out that direction. And uh, as we all know, the pandemic happened in 2020 and I was supposed to graduate, or I did, I did graduate from grad school in 2020, but halfway through, it was actually immediately after I finished the piece on the right here, um, the pandemic happened and we thought we were all going to, you know, just close for a little bit and then we closed forever. <laughs> so what happened was, is I went from having a fantastic community with access to materials and access to kilns and having wonderful dialogue with everybody in, in, in my program to no dialogue at all, no contact really with anybody besides like texting and some Zoom calls and everybody just was really, really depressed, including me. And I just, I missed having my, my community. And so it sort of, I wanted to keep making. And so I started, I set up a small studio in my basement. It was about six feet tall and I'm about five, six. So it was just a little, I had a little bit of head space, but that was it. Um, and I started, I really wanted to figure out how to finish these with no access to it. So I started making these um, forms that are inspired by uh, Greco-Roman amphora. This is the this one of the first solo show that I had, and I fired them in uh, my pit firing in my backyard, <laughs> and um, it ended up being a really good time because I it was doing and stoking a fire at nine in the morning. One brings a lot of people to be like, "What are you doing?" So I got to meet my neighbors and uh, get to know them a little bit better. But also, it was a great way of getting my emotions out around the amount of loss that had happened around the pandemic, as well as um, the amount of sadness that I had. So I love that the way that the fire really took in and on these pieces and the ash is what makes them have this like really charcoaly uh, feeling to them. So, and then on the right is a larger piece that I did. Um, and you can tell that not all pieces survive that kind of firing. So on the bottom here is where all of the pieces that didn't survive. And then the pillar that, it, that this piece is standing on is, are the actual stones of that pit firing. Um, I thought it was a very good um, wrap up for that piece. It felt very, um, not dramatic, but appropriate for it. And then I started doing these amphora pieces because without any feet, because I, I just felt like it was a great symbolism for how I just felt like I couldn't stand anymore without anybody else. I just felt like I, I need some other kind of support in order to make this happen. Here's another shot of the, uh, the show a little bit wider shot. You can tell now see the scale of the piece that was I was showing before. Um, and then, like I said, not all of them really survived, but I really loved this beautiful way that the pieces fell apart almost in the firing. It just, it captured the emotions that I had so beautifully. Just so much sadness and depression that I had at the time. Afterward, I had another show at my old my undergrad graduate school, they asked me to come bring a show and that was it still in the pandemic. So it was actually really fun is this piece was in a really large hall that was being a, a pseudo classroom at the time. <laughs> and that classroom was having um, a, so it was like a really big room. And so this was on one side and the other side was a classroom. And that classroom was, uh, do, were chemistry classes. So I felt like it was very appropriate as a, a place to show my work next to chemistry going on. Um, and this piece, these, this, this installation, I really felt like was a great representation of finally closing the chapter on all of the work that I did in grad school, experimentations with clay bodies and color and stretched me to try to make something that I could still be really happy with. But at this time, I'd say, I'd say that I, I had started leaning more into the emotional part because of this show and making this work that I wanted to keep going with how can I excuse me, emotion. I then was asked to be a part of something that's called the Detroit Month of Design, 
um, with uh, a program called Form and Seek who brings designers and artists together to create a show. And this show was called, I believe it was called Here X Now. And it was a show about work made by designers and artists during the pandemic. And so I riffed off of the work that I'd made for that the Amphora show and made some larger pieces and pit fired them. So they still had that really big attentional emotion to them that I really loved, but they could be a, a little bit more functional sitting on a, sh on a, not on a shelf on a table. I wanted coming back to this photo real quick, this uh, chair um, made by Rachel Heiberg, 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 Heibel, excuse me, um, is made out of clay. It's made out of ceramic. It was a terrifying thing to sit on, but it was so much fun. And this, so this, this, show was my first look back at being a part of a community again and it was so exciting and so wonderful seeing people again I hadn't seen anybody for you know a year and a half and so it really brought life back into me after that I didn't make for a while I, I went back to sort of just making by myself and not making very much and then I applied for this uh, residency in Rome with Creta Rome, um, spelled C-R-E-T-A, uh, Rome. And it ended up being a, a really great experience of like getting back and being like, okay, let's let's do an international, let's stretch ourselves an international residency, let's make some work, let's brew, like get, get out there, be a part of the Roman art community again. And when I got there, I found out, oh, I am making by myself. Usually they have three artists in residence there at a time, and it was just me. So what I thought at the end of this residency was going to be a group show with two other artists where we could have dialogue ended up being a solo show with just me. And I just felt an immense amount of pressure and um, felt that sort of loneliness that I ha had during the beginning again or during the pandemic again. So I wanted to create a body of work that sort that that references you know, the reason I wanted to go to Rome was because of that first show with Amphora where it's referencing the Greco-Roman Amphora used for, for storing um, liquids and perfumes and oils. But I, I just was like, that emotion was coming back where I was just feeling frustrated and alone again. So I started making these pieces um, where I'm like using three different clay bodies, a terracotta, a black stoneware and a porcelain and inlaying them together. So they're having a dialogue as well as for me, I felt like they, I was trying to express like my frustration and my emotion that I was having at the time. Here's another piece that I love from that. So this is porcelain and in it is a red stoneware. And I love how it communicates with the terracotta of the other pieces. Instead of having these pieces on a stand like I did before, I wanted them to feel like they were just dying. So the, the show ended up being called Working Through It as I was working through the emotions that I had at the time. But I wanted it to feel like, oh my gosh, I'm still working through this. I'm still missing community. I want to be laying on top of somebody else. I want to be interacting with others. And so I wanted this show to really feel like a large sigh of almost frustration or, fr you know, the a range of emotions that you could have, but I wanted them all to still have that dialogue with each other. I ended up loving it and loving the show completely. So from the here, I'll do some close-ups on the, these. From here, I went immediately to Houston, actually. So I went from Rome to Houston. I got to spend Thanksgiving with my aunt and uncle who live here. And then immediately started my residency the 1st of December. And I wanted to hit the ground running. And so I ended up visiting a bunch of uh, museums around the area, obviously visiting the Manil and falling in love with um, Cy Twombly's work. I've known his work and appreciated his work forever, but I, I really felt a big connection this time. I ended up buying a book of, uh, about his him and his life called Making um, Past Present and finding out that he spent most of his life in Italy and had a huge connection to the stories of, you know, the Greek, Greek stories of Venus and Apollo and, and, and all of the stories that we get from Roman, the Roman, the Greco-Roman times. And I thought that that was fascinating because I, like, I was just there. Oh my gosh. And then I, I learning being in Rome, I learned that the only reason that we have those stories about all of these gods is because of pottery. Pottery was the way of portraying the stories of Hercules and, and um, it, without pottery and having that visual storytelling that, that could last a long time, 
we wouldn't have any um, of like his work as well, as well, or these like classical stories that everybody knows about. And I really appreciated it and loved that that connection that I had with him. And as well as I was already sort of doing some mark making that I felt was very, very similar to the works that he had already done. Um, so I take it, I took that inspiration. I really wanted to run with it. So coming and now being in, in uh, Houston and making work at the craft center, I got to be a part of, you know, actually be a part of a community again. And so I wanted to bring boy presentation and love of you know community back and be here with it so I started making lots of experiments I started doing a lot of colorful work which you'll see um I've as you can see I've mostly been either the clay body or black and white so I wanted to start doing these really fun colorful pieces <laughs> so just like um you know these are some of the first pieces that I made here the one on the left being like I am a little anxious, you know, just getting here. I'm wanting to, to do a really great job. So you can sort of see the anxiety in my, my mark making. And then on the one on the right, I wanted to be, um, I settled down a little bit and I wanted to be a stronger with it. And you can sort of see the emotional state that I had at the time when I'm making these pieces and these marks. These two, I feel like are a very great back to back because they are sort of reflecting their colors together. So. On the left is like a blue clay body with, with white inlaid in it. And then on the right is a white clay body with a blue inlaid in it. And I believe, I feel, I feel the playfulness of like community and, and love of color coming back into my work. What I feel is at the, the craft center here is that I was losing my love for ceramics because I was by myself so much. And I was really tired of making because I didn't have anybody to talk to about it or interact with. And I feel like ceramics and art in general is best when it, there's a community. Um, and so it's been so wonderful to be here and enjoy making again and want to experiment and want to be get other people's input and learn from other people. It's been uh, the best <laughs> to, to just be and enjoy and love again. So the piece on the left is a green clay body with a pink inlay in it. And the one on the right is terracotta. It's not, these both are actually not fired. Um, they, I wanted, to, they will get fired this week. I want it because it's been so short. I wanted to get some photos of some of the more fun pieces that I've made before um, this presentation. So it's a, a terracotta with a blue teal inlaid in it. And so it'll be a nice dark and orange rich colors. This was sort of like a nice piece that I did not know what I was going to be doing with when I when I first made it. Um, and it turned into this sort of love note to my husband that I love very much. And it helped with a lot of like me trying to explore and my fear of color because I felt like one color in ceramics is very expensive and time consuming because if you mess up you can't really it's really hard to redo it and because it will take three days to reconstitute it and it's this back and forth so I didn't know what I want to do and then it turned out to be this really wonderful playful um love note to my husband that I absolutely love and it feels like a really great um culmination of like knowledge and wonderfulness of community that I have learned and gotten to be with here at the craft center um, I wanted to say thank you so much, Natalie, for your introduction and to the Craft Center for having me. This has been really wonderful. Uh, I'm so happy to take your questions. I'm going to leave this up because I think it's nice to go back to some photos um, for reference, um, but I'm really happy to answer any questions now. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rebecca. That was wonderful to learn more about your practice and go on this journey of you from, you know, to Colorado, Detroit, to Rome, and now to here in Houston. Um, as Rebecca said, please leave any questions you have for her in the chat. And I have some of my own, so I'm going to start us off. You know, one thing that I know comes up and you've mentioned this a lot in your work is just that idea of community. And, you know, it, it, it really, I think you it, talk about it well of this lack of community and the you know the black and white and the stillness of it and then how you you know the color comes back and the mark making comes back you know in in focus of community as well mm -hmm. and I, you know I feel like you're such a community oriented person as well I know that um, when you go back to Grand Rapids you'll be opening your studio Suita Studios and you know from what you've told me I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about your idea because it's so community minded which I feel like is at the heart of your practice as well and I would love everyone to hear about that too. Yeah, absolutely. So 
So I bought, um, before going to this or getting to this residency, I bought a building that I could have a storefront in the basement and live upstairs. And um, I really wanted, because I had missed, like during the pandemic, I was scrambling to figure out how on earth am I gonna finish work? I, ceramics needs to have, you need to have a kiln, you need to have a space. And I really was missing it. I was scrambling around for it. I was, I decided that I wanted to be the, the person that could provide that for people who couldn't find it. And so because of that, like, I don't think I used to be uh, quite community oriented before the pandemic, but now post pandemic and feeling that uh, scrambling, I really wanted to create a space for people to come and make and explore ceramics in a way that they hadn't before. And um, community again, I miss that community so much. I want, I want, I was like, fine, I'm going to make it myself. So um, I'm really excited about it, getting back there. That's exciting. Well, well, I, I can't wait to keep up with you and see how, how it turns out. Um, one thing that I found fascinating that you were just telling me about last week is how you do your color inlay. And I feel like that's something that I don't see often enough. And I feel like it's something that maybe our viewers would be interested in learning a little bit more about your process. Absolutely. So um, for my pieces, I use what's called mason stains. Mason stains are also used to color both ceramic as well as concrete, which is very fun. Um, and they, you, it's just a powdery substance that I add into a slip and then I add that, dry out that slip and add it to a clay body and knead that clay body together. So I get one full, um, piece. So the, like the one on the left, that's exactly what happened. Um, and then I will take the slip of that and I will um, use it to inlay. So the first day I use a pencil, just a regular generic, um, mechanical, dull mechanical pencil. And I will do my mark making and make sure that it's deep enough so that when I apply the clay into that mark, um, the clay will stay. And then I will scrape away any ex excess clay. Seems like one of those really detailed like ASMR processes that you can video. <laughs> <laughs> I have a couple of um, uh, time-lapse video on my Instagram. That's uh, very fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one thing I really think about with your work is how you display the work. Um, you know, going back to the earthenware pieces you fired early in the pandemic, where you, you know, displayed them on the actual firing stones and as well as displayed, um, you know, the pieces that didn't make it through as a full piece and even, you know, the structures to the left as well. And then the, to your other show, um, with the colorful pieces, I may make sure I'm saying the name of the show right. Um, by yourself, make by yourself is that the right one? Um, where I don't the think work so. down. Um, so oh. the solo show in Rome. I wrote it down, but I can't find. Oh, my... oh uh, working through it. Yes, we're working through it. Thank you. Um, yeah. You know, and and literally having works upside down and on their sides, and I think that display is so interesting. And we're used to ceramics being so precious and installed in a certain way. And to to see a display where I mean it's very intentional from you, but I think it adds such another layer. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about that display. Absolutely. I wanted, I, you know, I've been so used to making pieces that, you know, sit very cleanly on a desk or on a table that I really experimenting with a piece that doesn't have a foot really forces you to start thinking of other ways of displaying it. So starting with making, you know, this, the, this solo show with um, Amphora, I made all of these wire, um, holders so that they could be displayed more like stereotypically how you would see a piece if it did have a foot but going from that to um this this show working through it I feel like gives such a wonderful emotion about it it makes because ceramics itself the way we talk about vessels is so person oriented we say like oh this this uh, vessel has a lip, it has a hip, it has hips, it has shoulders. The, the clay is a clay body. We, we talk about it as if they're people already. I think that like showing them like people would almost gives them, it, it continues that personality that they have. Yeah, I think that goes back to your idea of community too. I wrote that down several times in the notes I was taking today about, you know, the use of body and language and laying down, leaning on each other and how you were even talking about it, you know, propping each other up and leaning. You really see that interaction of a, like the interaction of a community, of a clay body. And it really, I think, comes through um, your concepts as well. So that's really, that's really fascinating. So much, Natalie. I appreciate it. 
Um, well, how has Houston been for you? How has been having open studios and working with the public? I love it so much. I think it, I personally, I've always really enjoyed working and talking to people at the same time. For me, it's really just like a really enjoyable experience for it. Also just people will, I'll be working in the same project for like two weeks straight. And somebody will come and be like, have you thought about this? And I was like, no, I haven't thought about that. Thank you for pointing it out. And I, I think that it's such a wonderful way of just interacting in a, and thinking and exchanging of ideas that you know, I have missed for so long that being here and having an open studio pretty much whenever I'm here and being able to talk to other artists has really made me just so incredibly happy. That, <laughs> that's me. It, it stretches me, but it makes me just it, excited as well. Well, it feels very full circle as you were talking about your work at the beginning of the pandemic and feeling that loneliness going to Rome, expecting a group, you know, coming here, having a group in a community, and now you're going back to Grand Rapids to open up your own community. So it feels very, you know, full circle in this moment. Absolutely. And I'm really thankful for that, to be honest. It's been, it's, it's really been a very healing journey in that sense. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, Rebecca, for spending your afternoon with us. Um, and for sharing your practice in the last few months with us. Um, Rebecca's here till the end of the month. So you have some time to catch her in your studio and her studio and to ask some questions. And, and I do recommend coming in to see her mark making pieces up close. They're really beautiful to look at the inlay lines and to look at all the colors and to see them up close and personal. You know, the, um, the lines are so fine and I'm just still impressed how you add that inlay in such a beautiful, fine detail way. Um, so we're so excited to have had you here this, this winter. Thank you so much, Natalie. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And I want to say thank you to both Lakia and Rebecca for sharing your studios today. It's one of my favorite parts of the residency, just to hear and see what you're working on. Um, as I said, they're both here for a little bit longer, so please come back and visit. They're all in their studios on Saturdays and then other select days of the week. Um, our next artist talk will be April 15th with Young Su other ceramicist and Miles Gracie, a furniture maker. And so we're very excited to continue learning about our residents. I do want to mention that our next cycle of resident applications is open right now. It closes on March 1st. So if you or anyone you know would like to apply for the program, please visit us on our website. All of the information is there. And, you know, the Craft Center and the Craft Community love our residents. So we hope to see you all again soon at the Craft Center. Thank you both for spending time with us today. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.